said unto him, Sir, we would see Jesus. By your Holy Spirit, we pray so this evening. In his name, Amen. Please be seated. Well, the shops are shut. The last UPS and Amazon deliveries have been gone for the night. If you haven't got the presents now, well, you're toast, basically. Generally, I pride myself on giving Lucy pretty good gifts. Thoughtful gifts, things that I think she will really enjoy. Although, of course, over the last 24 years of marriage, there have been one or two misfires. I was very perplexed one year when she didn't really take kindly to the gift of a Wellington boot rack, which I thought was a brilliant gift and very practical. Lucy thought otherwise. Of course, there were the gift of those wonderful bubble bath petals that she did love, except I warned her not to pour them all in at once and not to do so in the jacuzzi bath. The result was that it took three days for the bubbles to finally appear, disappear from our bathroom. But this year, Christmas came early, and Lucy gave me a present that was probably the best present she has ever given me in our married life, with the exception of saying yes to getting married. I was simply bowled over by it. Indeed, I was lost for words, and anyone who knows me knows that that's a very rare occurrence. Some of you may know that my mother died when I was in college quite suddenly. And when you're in college, you don't really want stuff left over. I didn't have anywhere to put the furniture, the china, the silver. I had no need for it. I didn't have need for anything much, really. But the one thing I had of my mother's was a fairly nondescript cigarette case. Yes, there were the days when people used to keep cigarettes on their coffee table, in boxes. And this originally silver, but now much worn cigarette box was everything I had, pretty much, to remember my mother. Eventually, as I used it to keep my odds and my sort of cufflinks in and things by my bed, well, the top of it became detached and the lid sort of fell off. Over the years, its condition continued to deteriorate. The soldering wasn't brilliant. It wasn't, after all, a particularly expensive item. And bit by bit, it began to fall apart. Till eventually, it was simply in pieces. I was tempted to throw it away. But it was, after all, one of the few remembrances that I had of my mother. So I put it in an envelope, put it in my desk, and pretty well felt, forgot about it. Last summer, I had one of those rare fits of sorting things out. It happens once in a while, not too often. And as I was sorting out, I realized I couldn't find the envelope. And then I realized, sadly, that well, it must have been thrown away thrown away with some of the other stuff, mistakenly for just an envelope, amongst envelopes. Now, as Lucy, as you may know, Lucy looks after our holiday cottages, which are on our farm at home in England. Guests come and go and stay for a week. Some guests, well, we barely see them. Others, we probably see a little too much. Well, there was a couple from in London staying, and they wanted to chat to Lucy. They were very chatty. Lucy, over the course of conversation, maybe over a cup of tea, found out that the gentleman was a retired silversmith. Indeed, not only was he a silversmith, but he'd had his entire career at Garrett's, the Royal Jewelers. He was a fine silversmith. So Lucy took the plunge and asked him if he could take a look at this envelope of pieces the envelope that contained the remains of my mother's cigarette box. Give it to me, he said. I'll see what I can do. It was only after handing over the piece of paper and the envelope that Lucy realised she had just given the one single remembrance of my mother to a man who was almost a complete stranger, someone she didn't know. 
She didn't know if this man was a silversmith or a robber, whether he was just a joker and trying it on. But a couple of months passed, and then out of the blue, very unexpected, with no forewarning at all, a package arrived. A package that eventually Lucy handed over to me as a present. And in this package, well, I couldn't work out what it could be. I was thinking it could be, well, I just didn't know. And she waited and waited as I unwrapped layer after layer to see what it could possibly be. I was excited, but I was almost perplexed even as I took the final piece of paper off. And there it was. This beautiful, fully restored cigarette box. Not only had this gentleman managed to put it beautifully back together, but he'd had it resilvered. It was better than brand new. It was quite something, and is quite something, to behold. I'll come back to that in a minute. In today's all-familiar passage, God sets out about giving humankind the greatest gift of all time, his only son. And Luke writes, and it came to pass. Luke is like a doctor, telling the facts as it is. The story of Jesus' birth began during the reign of the worst, one of the most remarkable of leaders in ancient history. Excuse me. Born Octavius, named after his father, he came to the attention of his great uncle, a man by the name of one Julius Caesar. Eventually, Julius Caesar adopts Octavius and makes him his heir. Only one year later, after becoming the heir to Julius Caesar, Julius Caesar is murdered in 45 BC. Octavian, well, he sees the empire split between him, Mark Antony, and another high-ranking official called Levidus. Decades of civil war in the Roman Empire ensue. Eventually, Levidus is pushed aside, even though he's married to Mark Antony's sister. And then eventually, two huge, enormous armies face off against each other. One is Mark Antony's. It's huge. It outnumbers Octavius on every score. But Octavian is, well, he's more nimble. He's more strategic. He's a thinker. So, eventually, eventually, Mark Antony and Cleopatra, his lover, are defeated. And Rome, for the first time, is once again united. <coughs> Octavian decides, well, he's going to take a new name, a new name as an emperor, and that's the name we know him by, Caesar Augustus. He brings Pax Romana, but not only that, an administrative genius, and of course, large sums of money from the wealth plundered from the Egyptians. The Roman economy booms. And this is the world that Jesus was born into. A world where there had been a political saviour, Caesar. But being a political saviour wasn't enough. No, the world needed something more than that. The world needed a true saviour. And this census that Joseph and Mary had to go and be part of wasn't just a simple record-keeping exercise. It was the most efficient taxation register in the history of the Roman Empire. So Joseph makes that 80-mile trip to Nazareth, from Nazareth to Bethlehem with Mary. And then Luke just simply says, she brought forth his firstborn son. Like a doctor, he just passes over the birth almost completely. He just gives a strikingly simple account 
very little of the details themselves. Imagine Mary, separated from her family. She may have given birth to her first child as a young woman of only 12 or 14, possibly completely alone. Alone in a stable, not even in a decent room, surrounded by animals, the filth and the dirt. Indeed, when we talk about swaddling cloths that the babe was wrapped in, well, that translates into torn strips of linen, possibly the only other garment that Mary might have had that is literally torn up so that she can put something around her newborn baby. No lovely baby clothes, no crib, just a manger. Terrifying for anyone but particularly terrifying for a young 12 to 14 year old. A young 12 to 14 year old who really doesn't know what's going on, who's had this visit from an angel, who's betrothed to a man and yet has already had a child. At the same time, an angel appears to the shepherds announcing the birth, not just of a child, but says this, a saviour who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign you will find him, a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. The angel brought good tidings. That translates into preach the gospel, the good news. Not just, well, there's been a baby born, but there's been the baby born, the baby that we have been waiting for. Shepherds never left their flocks. They stayed out in the fields because there was fear that animals could eat them. People could steal them. But we read that without hesitation, they got up and they went. They went immediately and lo and behold, they found the baby as the angel had predicted. But imagine you're Mary. She's just recovering from having the trauma of giving birth and suddenly these angels, these shepherds appear. Shepherds were the lowest of the low. They didn't wash, they were illiterate, probably didn't smell very nice. They weren't people you normally saw in the towns, in fact, they never went into the towns. And there they were, a whole group of them, who just turned up uninvited. One could imagine this could have been the straw that broke Mary's back. The camel's back was finally broken. It's one thing to give birth alone in a stable, but now this. You can imagine the conversation could have been, Joseph, I'm out of here. Pack up, we're leaving. I'm going back to my mother and I'm going back now. But Mary didn't. You see, Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. God didn't randomly pick Mary. No, he knew Mary better than Mary knew herself. A child is a wonderful gift to mother no matter what. Whenever you look at a newborn baby, you see that wonderful new creation, those tiny little fingers, those tiny little toes. This gift, well, it's the saviour, the saviour of the whole world. And once again, throughout the world, he will be received again in joyous occasions in our hearts and minds. You see, for many of us, we're a bit like this tin. You see, we were broken. We were tarnished. We'd lost our luster. The value had certainly worn off and we were in danger of being lost thrown away, discarded, no longer something treasured, no longer something that has real meaning. But all we have to do in our brokenness, in our tarnishness, in our feeling that somehow the pieces don't fit together, well, all we have to do is trust him. You see, God has given us this gift and the gift is Jesus. Jesus who restores us. Jesus who renews us. And Jesus who redeems us. A wise man said, if our greatest need was to have information, 
then God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need was technology, well, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need was money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need was pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But whether we know it or not, our greatest need was to be, well, to be restored, to be renewed and to be redeemed. So God's gift to us, well, it wasn't an educator, wasn't a scientist, wasn't an economist or an entertainer. God's gift to us tonight is our Saviour. Whatever is under your Christmas tree in the morning or in your stocking at the end of your bed tomorrow, you have the greatest gift. You just have to receive it tonight in your hearts and minds by his Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.